For the past couple of years, I have uh, given a talk at EAA AirVenture in Oshkosh about what I've learned uh, over the past uh, 13 years or so of doing electronic logbooks. Uh, and uh, I've decided to record it here for those people who unfortunately cannot make it out to Oshkosh. So my name is Eric Berman. I'm the owner and uh, primary developer of My Flight Book, which is a free cloud-based open source logbook uh, for pilots. I am a commercially rated, instrument rated, single engine land, single engine sea, and multi-engine land uh, pilot with about 1,600 hours. Uh, I fly primarily for fun, uh, but I have been uh, doing my flight book uh, since about uh, 2006. So my background is in software. It's, uh, my degrees are in, in electrical engineering and physics, but uh, ended up not doing that. Uh, I was at Microsoft through much of the 90s. Uh, I was a program manager, and I was a vice president at Expedia. And so I was always managing teams of software developers. I didn't get to write a whole lot of code myself. Um, since then, I've been dividing my time uh, between E8, which is an angel investing group. Happy to talk about that offline. Uh, it's not it's not aviation uh, related. Um, with various uh, charities that I'm passionate about, and I've been doing uh, my flight book as well. So. In 2006, I had just left Expedia and I looked around, I needed a logbook, and this is more or less what the landscape looked like for logbooks. There really wasn't much. Uh, there were a few apps that you could download to your uh, PC or your Mac uh, and, and do your logbook there, or you could do an ad hoc spreadsheet, um, but there really wasn't very much. And I realized um, that from my, my time at, uh, at, at Expedia, the importance of having a cloud-based uh, system, being able to access uh, your logbook from anywhere. And having just left Expedia, I needed a coding project, and I thought, wow, what a great project uh, to be able to do. So uh, thus, my flight book was born. Uh, I started out originally just sharing it with a few friends, but a few friends shared it with a few friends, and I've now got over 90,000 pilots using uh, the system. There's over 7 million flights in the system, and I've basically spent nothing on advertising. Uh, I once spent uh, a, a $100 on Google, and it, it, it wasn't worth it. Um, it's been basically uh, word of mouth. So let me start by answering a very basic question. What is an electronic logbook? So at its simplest form, an electronic logbook is this. It's a spreadsheet. It's a set of columns and rows. Uh, and a lot of people do keep their, um, their logbooks in this format. And there are a number of, of advantages to doing a spreadsheet. One is it's dirt simple. You just put your data in. You can structure it however you like. If you want to track some uh, obscure attribute of flights, you just add a new column. It works. Uh, and with the advent of web-based uh, spreadsheets like Google Sheets, you can keep it up in the cloud and have access to it anywhere. And if you're a whiz with pivot tables, uh, you can do some pretty sophisticated queries and totals and, and analysis. And so uh, that actually works pretty well for a lot of people. But there are some serious drawbacks uh, to using a spreadsheet. Uh, one is that uh, it is ad hoc. Uh, the, the spreadsheet doesn't know anything about the rules of flying. So it, it, computing things like currency, uh, 8710 forms, progress towards ratings can be really, really difficult, um, especially if you're not always with pivot tables. Um, Another problem is that it's just strictly two-dimensional data, so it's hard to include things like pictures or videos or flight paths or show things on a map. And it also uh, isn't what's called a normalized uh, database, uh, which is a fancy way of saying that if you fly the same airplane five times on five separate flights, you have to put the airplane's information in five separate times. And besides being redundant, uh, that can also lead to errors if you enter it in incorrectly one of those times. But it's a, it's a good place to start. And we'll come back to spreadsheets because the, the beauty of a spreadsheet is that it is a great uh, a tool for uh, data interchange. 
So a better electronic logbook, and this gets a little bit to where things were in 2006, is a program running on a computer. I put the little brains here on the computer. And this has the advantage that it can use a proper database, it can, and it knows the rules of flying. So it can do things like computing currency or computing totals and doing all of the relevant slice and dice for you. Uh, but this also has some problems. Um, if your hard disk crashes, you're out of luck. If they stop supporting whatever you're running on your PC, uh, you're out of luck. If they uh, have a bug, you have to wait until the next update of the software uh, to get the bug fix, and you probably have to pay for that as well. And most of the logbooks um, have actually evolved from this to something a little bit more sophisticated, where it's still the same basic model, but it will at least back up uh, or sync to uh, to the cloud. So it's still doing all of the processing on the PC, uh, but at least if you have if if you lose your PC, uh, your hard disk crashes, whatever, you can still uh, get your data. I think a better model is to move the uh, the brains and the database up into the cloud, and then be able to access that data from a PC, a phone, or a tablet. Uh, and this is the model that, um, that my flight book uses. And it has a number of advantages. One is that you can access your data from anywhere. Uh, you, you don't have to wait until you get home to put things uh, uh, into your logbook like you do with a PC-based uh, program. Another is that the cloud is industrial strength, reliable, backed up. Uh, you know, if you're hosting on uh, Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud or Microsoft Azure, these things are, are incredibly redundant in terms of power, in terms of hard disk, and so forth. So your data is really safe. You do have to have an account, and that account has to be strong uh, to make sure that you've got the proper uh, security and everyone who does this, I, I think there's no issue there. Uh, but it's it's a better model overall, and this is where uh, most of the of the modern uh, electronic logbooks are uh, uh, these days. Uh, Four flight is my flight book is, and so forth. And it can actually get a little better than this because what you can do is if you can download your data. Um, and you can upload your data, then you can actually even do things like bulk uh, edit. But you can also save a, a backup of your data to Dropbox or Google Drive or OneDrive uh, so that you're not dependent on my flight book. Um, I think I'm actually the only one who, who provides that particular service. Uh, but it, it gives you access to your data in a spreadsheet form uh, that you can do whatever analysis you want on it. Uh, and, and is not dependent on my flight book and can be uh, interchanged with other, uh, other apps. Uh, but having it in the cloud enables these sorts of scenarios. And as an aside, I feel really strongly just uh, on a philosophical basis, your, your logbook should be free. Flying is expensive enough. Uh, you get nickel and dime on all sorts of things in flying. Uh, everyone should have their their logbook in the cloud and using a professional electronic logbook and that should not there should be no barriers to that and cost is a barrier and I I do not believe uh, that that there should be any cost it's your data you shouldn't have to uh, pay to to keep it all right so how do you get started with an electronic logbook well suppose you can burn your logbook but uh, there are better ways and in particular, if you've already got uh, data, th there are uh, two ways that you can get started. One is if you have it in an electronic form and can get it into a spreadsheet, see I said I'd get back to spreadsheets, then you can generally import your data pretty easily. And I have separate videos on that and my other um, AirVenture talk is about uh, well, goes into uh, actually both of these uh, in a little bit uh, more detail. Uh, the other way you can go is you can make a clean break and put starting totals into the system uh, and say everything before a certain date is just lumped together in those starting totals and everything after that date is recorded flight by flight. So if you want to import, you want a CSV file. CSV stands for comma separated values and it's nothing more than a universal spreadsheet interchange format 
every spreadsheet program on the planet can read it. Every spreadsheet program on the planet can write it. And it, it's, its beauty is its simplicity. You can even open it up in a text editor and read it yourself. It is nothing more than a text file where you're representing a two-dimensional spreadsheet table and every line of text represents a row in the table and the columns within a, a row are, are in, separated by commas, hence comma separated values. Um, so if you were to open up this particular file on the first line, you'd see date, comma, flight ID, comma, model, comma, and so forth. Um, so pretty much every logbook app out there can export in a CSV in some form, and every logbook app can import in CSV in some form. And so in the case of my flight book, I have a dictionary of column headers, uh, you know, that that first line there on the spreadsheet that you can see, which uh, tells you which uh, which what what the data in that column is. So you don't have to have a particular order to the columns. You just have to have uh, the the first row has to tell tell the system what each column uh, contains in it. Uh, and then you can import and uh, and and get get started. Now, a lot of people, your flights are on paper. And so my recommendation typically is hire some neighborhood kid, your niece, your nephew, your son, your daughter, to do uh, the data entry for you. One of the other advantages of a spreadsheet is that it is the fastest way that you can do data entry. You can just type a value, hit tab, type a value, hit tab, type uh, and, and hit enter at the end of a row to go to the next uh, row. It is very, very fast. There's no validation. There's no waiting for a web page to load. You don't have to do all that network back and forth. So hiring someone to do that data entry into a spreadsheet, and then obviously you want to take a look at the spreadsheet and make sure that everything uh, is in order, uh, but then you can import it. And I, in general, I think that is the best way uh, to go. But sometimes you can't, you ju it's just not practical to do that. And that's where I recommend using uh, starting totals. And starting totals is nothing more than a set of placeholder flights in in your logbook that capture those totals. Um, and you, you can obviously do this in any logbook app, not just my flight book. Um, but the but the idea is you just put in a placeholder uh, a flight. And that actually has a few uh, key advantages. One advantage of doing that is that there's no ambiguity of uh, whether when you do a query and try and find out, you know, how much time do you have in in a certain kind of airplane or between a certain set of dates, there's no ambiguity about whether or not you should include the flights. It's a flight like any other, and so if you search on criteria that includes it, it's included, and if you search on criteria that's not that that misses it, then it's not included. Another advantage is that it's editable uh, because they're flights just like any other. You can uh, uh, you, you can record anything that you might want to total. If you want to total the number of aircraft carrier landings or firefighting missions that you've done, you can record uh, those in your starting totals as well. Um, and then the, the other advantage is that because they're editable, if you add your old flights over time, you can edit these starting total flights to back out uh, uh, the time that you're adding so that you're not double counting uh, any time. Um, okay, so I've made the switch to an electronic logbook. I'm going to talk for a moment here about why, or for a few minutes, why electronic logbooks are different than paper and you need to think about them uh, differently. So, first of all, you've got different scenarios. And in the paper world, these might each have their own distinct logbooks because they're recording different things. You've got general aviation where you are re recording uh, uh, training towards ratings and you're typically doing fairly basic stuff, uh, pilot and command time, nighttime, instrument time, uh, and category and class. Gliders keep separate logbooks often. Uh, because they have to keep track of the kind of launches that they uh, that they do, and they're counting flights in in, in different ways, uh, and uh, maximum altitudes that they reach, and things like that. Military has to keep track of their own uh, special 
uh, attributes. Airline pilots have to keep track of part 117 um, rest periods and duty periods and uh, block time uh, uh, rather than Hobbes time. So they're all different scenarios, although often these can be the same pilot uh, just you know, flies for the for the airlines on the weekdays and on the weekends does some uh, GA or or flies a glider just for fun. So there's a core set of of attributes for a flight that everybody uh, records: pilot and command time, total time, any ground simulator time, uh, night time, instrument time, number of landings, those kinds of things. That applies across the board to pretty much any flying scenario. But everything else very quickly gets into very specialized uh, kinds of things. I've just done four scenarios here, but there are really many, many, many more. So what I've done on, in my flight book is I've created, I use the term property, sorry, I'm a software geek, that's the, sort of the software term. You can think of them as attributes, or some people call them categories, uh, that you can uh, attach to a flight. And there are over 650 of them at the moment in the system. Any given pilot, is going to use a tiny subset of that that list of 650 properties but that subset they're going to use a lot that military pilot who's on an aircraft carrier they're recording aircraft carrier landings every day most of us will never get to experience the thrill of a carrier landing and so the system is smart about automatically showing you the properties that you've used before and therefore adapting to the kind of flying that you do or you can set up templates, uh, and this is a fairly new feature uh, on the system, where you can say, here's the kind of flight I'm doing. It's a training flight. It's a, it's a firefighting flight. It's a, an angel flight or something like that. And bring in the properties that are appropriate for that particular kind of, of a flight. So the, the broader point on this slide is that electronic logbooks are adaptable in a way that paper cannot be. And, and an electronic logbook can, can grow and adapt to all sorts of scenarios, whereas a paper logbook has to pick a scenario and go deep with it. Another way that electronic is uh, very different from paper is totals. In a paper logbook, you're doing subtotals on every page, and then you do a couple of flights on the next page, but you don't bother uh, adding in your totals until you've filled up that page, which means that Almost all of the time, your totals on, in your paper logbook are not up to date. And then when it comes time to do a search for how much time do you have in high performance aircraft, it's even harder to do uh, on a paper logbook. So with, with electronic, your totals are always up to date. As, uh, once you enter a flight, your totals reflect uh, uh, the addition of that flight. And doing uh, filters to see how much time do you have in high performance airplanes, how much uh, uh, time do you have um, in, uh, you know, how much, how much, at night, how much time uh, do you have in multi-engine airplanes at night. These are queries that are, are very easy to do in um, an electronic logbook and very difficult to do uh, with paper. And uh, you know, this is actually a large part of why I started with my flight book is that I would have these insurance queries every year that wanted to know how many hours do you have in purple airplanes on Tuesdays and months ending in Y. And it was just really, really hard. Uh, but once you have the data in a database, these become very uh, easy uh, kinds of queries uh, to do. Your currency is likewise always up to date. Figuring out wh what day was 90 days ago, let's see, last month had 31 days and the month before that had 30 days. That can be uh, difficult. Uh, you know, did I have my six approaches and hold within six months to get uh, my IFR currency it can be difficult. So your currency is always up to date in, a, in an electronic logbook. And uh, you can keep track of, of things beyond just currency. You can keep track, for example, of uh, uh, maintenance in an airplane, so you know when your VOR check is due or when your altimeter check is due. You can keep track of your medical and your flight review, and you can even make up custom currency rules or deadlines. Uh, so a, a currency rule might be for a, a uh, an FBO or a flying club that you have to have so many hours in a particular airplane uh, within a particular time period in order to meet an insurance requirement. Um, 
and the deadline might be uh, like what I have here on this slide where I have to grease the prop when I get uh, to 231.7 hours on the tack for, uh, for that particular airplane. You can also keep track of your progress towards ratings. Um, this is another thing that's, that's very difficult uh, to do because this, this starts getting uh, with paper because it, it starts getting into specific combinations and conditions of things. You know, how much solo time do you have at night? Uh, and uh, you know, how much training time do you have uh, on a long cross country that goes at least 250 nautical miles or things like that? The system currently has, I think it's like over 80 different ratings that it tracks. Uh, and you can see, do you have the requisite experience to go for the check ride on that uh, rating? Likewise, when you, when you want to go for a check ride, you have to fill in your 8710 form. And this, a lot of the, a lot of the totals here are pretty easy to get on a paper log, but, but again, some of them are not. Uh, very easy, uh, particularly what I refer to as combination properties. So, for example, cross-country instruction. So you have to have both instruction, you have instruction on a cross-country flight. Or um, how much night pilot and command time uh, do you have? Which actually gets to a, a, a subtle uh, difference here. So let's, uh, uh, between paper and, and electronic. So let's take a look at two hypothetical flights. Flight number one you have 2.1 hours of total time logged on the flight. And you have 2.1 hours of pilot and command time. You have 2.1 hours of night time, but you didn't log any night PIC time. Flight number two, also 2.1 hours. This one you logged 2.1 hours of PIC time and 0 0.2 hours of night time but you also logged 2.1 hours of night PIC time. So how much should each of these flights contribute to the 8710 night PIC? Well, if you look on the left flight, it's pretty obvious if you had, if it's a 2.1 hour flight and all of it was filled with pilot and command time and all of it was filled with night time, then it was all night PIC time. So the fact that you didn't log night PIC time, uh, is is fine because you can figure out that it was all night PIC time. There's 2.1 hours of night PIC time there. So there's really no need to have logged it. In flight number two, it's pretty clear since there was only 0.2 hours of night that the maximum possible amount of, PIC, of night PIC time that you had was 0.2, which means that the logged 2.1 is very clearly wrong. So it turns out that you can compute this way more accurately uh, than you can log it by just looking at the numbers and generally it's a, it's a minimum uh, operation. And so uh, in an electronic logbook, or at least in my flight book, I generally don't let you uh, log, explicitly log combination uh, properties for this reason because they can be computed. So if you can, um, if you enter it, it's redundant and if you enter it wrong, well, you've entered it wrong, and it's it's an error. So why why let you enter it? S paper and and electronic logbooks are just different when it comes to layout. Uh, a lot of people want their their print version of their uh, of their logbook to look just like their paper logbook, and there's really no reason for that. And if you look here uh, on, on this screenshot, you've got a set of columns for each category and class that you fly. Well, in, in the paper world, you have to print this before you know what you're going to fly. The, 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 the form is fixed. And so in this particular case, I've got a column for single engine land, a column for multi-engine land, and two blank columns for two other category classes of aircraft that I might fly. Well, I've got some single engine sea time, I've got some helicopter time, and I've got some glider time. Oops, I've got three columns that I need and it's only got two. Well, why does it, does it use all of that real estate for the category and class? The reason is human computation. When you're doing your subtotals and your totals, paper knows that you're going to want to know how much time you have in each category and class, so it puts them in a separate column so that it's easy to total. 
Well, computers don't need it in a column to, to be able to still keep those to subtotals uh, distinct. So all of that uh, real estate is pointless. You can do that all in one column in an electronic logbook. Similarly, down at the bottom, you're using a huge amount of real estate for per page subtotals. Why? Because with manual computation, pencil and paper computation, it's really painful to have to go back to the first flight every time you want to uh, uh, compute your totals. Computers don't mind doing that. So all of that real estate is there specifically for manual computation that you're not doing. So it, it's an archaic um, uh, layout uh, that's used to solve a limitation of paper. And if you're not on paper, that limitation doesn't exist. Therefore, the whole reason to have per page subtotals goes away. You can probably put pictures into your paper logbook, but what are you going to do? Duct tape your uh, phone into your logbook to save a video? Well, electronic logbooks can have pictures and videos attached to flights, no problem. That's, that's They're beautifully uh, set up for that. For, if you're an airline pilot just going uh, back and forth between uh, two cities on a daily basis, it's your job. It's probably not that exciting for each uh, flight. In fact, I might argue you don't want excitement <laughs> on those flights. But at least in the general aviation world, sharing your flight experience with other people, it, it, I mean, you're flying because of that experience. And you want to share that, particularly if you've taken pictures uh, and have cool experience to share. And so uh, on my flight book, for example, you can share your flight, including its pictures and including its uh, it, its path on a map, on uh, with other pilots on Facebook, on Twitter, on on wherever wherever you, you like, so that other people can see. Hey, here, check out this this cool picture I took of, of Mount Rainier uh, today on my on my Angel flight. And you can also when when the uh, when the recipient views this, they can see where you were when you took each picture. They can see your uh, route of flight. Um, it's all controlled by your privacy settings. You have to, on that given flight, you have to actually say people can see this stuff. So there is a privacy component. Uh, but this is something you just can't do with a paper logbook. Logbooks are scrapbooks in a way. People reminisce about the flights they took. Why not make it a richer experience? And in an electronic logbook, models rule. Not the Ben Stiller models, these models. So you've got uh, a, a multi-engine turbine aircraft uh, like a 747, you've got tailwheel aircraft, you've got high performance and complex aircraft, you've got different categories and classes like helicopters or gliders or hot air balloons or even drones. And this is an important uh, uh, point, is that every flight has an aircraft. That aircraft might be a simulator. That's fine. You're still simulating an aircraft. You're still simulating a helicopter or you're simulating a jet or you're simulating a 172. Every aircraft is associated with a model and the model tells you everything. It tells you the category and class. It tells you the family. It tells you it, uh, what type rating is required to fly that aircraft and it tells you what capabilities uh, that aircraft has. Is it high performance? Is it tailwheel? Is it complex? All of this tells you what you need to do to be able to compute currency uh, and to be able to uh, compute totals like how much complex time do I have? How much tailwheel time do I have? Am I tailwheel current? Am I Boeing 737 current? Um, and I've discovered that actually Pilots are picky about models. If someone enters your your 172S as a 172P, whoo, people uh, get get a little bit touchy about that. But this is good, because um, the data is crowdsourced. Um, so you, it, people being picky about that is actually a really good thing. What it means is that you have a huge data set, which reduces the need for data entry, because what you want to put in is probably already in there. It reduces errors because the stuff is already in there and you're not likely to, to make an error uh, when, when well, you can't make an error if you're selecting what's already in there. Um, and when something gets in with an error, 
it's found, the error is found really quickly and corrected. So the trend over time uh, is towards greater and greater accuracy. And so as of early July 2019, I've got uh, over 4,700 models of aircraft in the system, over 210,000 air, distinct aircraft, uh, nearly 60,000 of which have images. Um, and even though I've got 60,000 uh, built-in aircrafts, uh, uh, airports, I've already got 2,900 additional airports that people have, have put in just from crowdsourcing. So the whole system gets better the more that people use it. In fact, probably the, the best example of crowdsourcing is the feature ideas and enhancement ideas that people send to me. Um, but there, there are other advantages of crowdsourcing. I, I look at that uh, aircraft number and the air images number. You go and put in um, a flight uh, that, that you uh, uh, took at, at an FBO when you were on vacation 10 years ago. Uh, somebody adds a, uh, an image of that aircraft that you didn't have at the time. Now you get that image because the each aircraft has uh, the, the aircraft are shared and the uh, the images associated with those aircraft are shared among the pilots. There are regulatory uh, issues with electronic though. Uh, one common uh, issue that that arises is signatures. How do how does an instructor sign uh, a an individual flight or um, issue an endorsement? So the FAA at least has a an advisory circular that uh, uh, describes what criteria you have to meet in order for them to accept digitally signed uh, logbooks and endorsements and so forth. They don't certify logbooks. We all have to self-certify. And uh, I believe all the major uh, uh, electronic logbooks, certainly including my flight book, uh, are compliant with the advisory circular. Uh, but in other jurisdictions, other countries, uh, they may or may not uh, accept that. Privacy. If your uh, logbook is is on paper and it's in your car, uh, it's pretty safe. But you, you have the privacy issue of what if somebody breaks into your car um, and and steals it. Well, you don't have that issue uh, in the cloud, uh, but you do have other privacy issues. Make sure to read everybody's uh, privacy statement uh, or whoever you use. Uh, make sure to read the privacy statement. Make sure that it's really strong. Um, my flight book privacy statement is very simple and very strong. I don't share anybody's data. Uh, but you're also looking to make sure that best practices around data security are, uh, are followed. Again, I think everybody follows best practices here regarding encryption, regarding firewalls, and, and all of that. Um, I certainly do for my flight book. Um, but it, you you do you do want to ask the question. It actually is important. Um, there are differences in uh, how regulatory bodies uh, mandate that logging occur. Uh, I think the FAA is actually pretty uh, enlightened here. They tend to say you must record the fact that you did something in a manner acceptable to the administrators. So deliberately keeping it vague and open and saying, you have to log that something happened, but they're not gonna tell you precise wording you have to use and lay out. Whereas uh, in Europe, the, the uh, ESA logbook uh, requirements, they actually say, you know, column one shall be the date and it shall be in year, month, day uh, uh, format. Column two will be the time in UTC and they they specify each column and they specify the format and expect you to follow that. It's very, very prescriptive. I'm a fan of the FAA uh, layout personally, um, but you know you, you deal with what you have to deal with. Uh, and uh, I do support an ESA uh, print layout that follows uh, that uh, layout for, uh, uh, for printing. Um, the, the ESA layout doesn't really uh, accommodate um, electronic all that well. Uh, sometimes the words uh, that the regulators use 
to uh, to describe what they're trying to do do not match what they're actually trying to do. A good example of this, in my opinion, was instrument currency 61.57C last year. Um, they, they, they did fix this, but it used to be a mess with regards to ATDs and FTDs and full flight simulators. Um, and the old wording was trying to make it easier to do a combination and it actually made it harder. But they they fixed that. It now... Um, you can mix and match. But the neat thing here was that they fixed the regulation last summer and had a go live date on that of, of last November. And so I coded it up last September uh, and put in a cutover date of November. And magically, on the day before the cutover uh, of the new regulation, uh, it was using the old rules. And then on the day that the new regulation took effect, while I slept, the new rules uh, started uh, being applied. So that's one of the other advantages of, of being cloud-based. And then there are things like what constitutes cross-country. I have a whole blog post on this. I encourage you to read it. Um, paper logbooks and my flight book, uh, for, for historical reasons, do support a cross-country field. But there's really no single definition of cross-country. In fact, it's meaningless to ask how much cross-country time did you have on a flight because it depends on for what purpose you're asking uh, that. Uh, the definition of cross-country is, uh, at least in the U.S., if you take off from one other from one airport and land at another, that's a cross-country flight. Except if you're trying to use it for uh, a particular meeting, a particular requirement for a particular rating, in which case it has to go a certain distance, the second airport has to be a certain distance from the first, Unless uh, and you have to land there, unless you don't, and that distance varies depending on what kind of a rating you're going for and uh, what kind of an aircraft you're flying. Uh, so you really have to ask cross country within the context of what uh, what goal you're trying to serve. So that's a little bit of a mess. And and there are other little things like what constitutes high performance um, in the U.S. At least um, it is you have an engine on the aircraft with more than 200 horsepower. It used to be, before 1997, that the aircraft had more than 200 horsepower. So uh, in August of 97, that rule changed, and you had aircraft like a Piper Seneca, which has two 200 horsepower engines for a total of 400 horsepower. So before August of 1997, flights in that aircraft were high performance flights because it had it had more than 200 horsepower, 400 horsepower. After August of 97, that no longer qualified as a high performance aircraft, so flights in it did not count as high performance time because it does not have an engine with more than 200 horsepower. So an electronic logbook can automatically handle that. My flight book handles that. Depending on the date of the flight uh, in a Seneca, uh, it will know uh, that the that it was high performance after a certain date or and not before a certain date. Or if you upgrade an aircraft to glass or to be a technically advanced aircraft, you might do that on a particular date and the flights before that were steam gauges and flights after that were uh, uh, technically advanced. So there are some interesting things here, again, that you can do with electronic that you can't do with, uh, with paper. But old habits do die hard. People still want it to, just, to look just like their paper logbook. Of course, there are numerous different uh, standards, if you will, uh, for how a paper logbook looks. So for that reason, my flight book supports about uh, seven or eight different uh, layouts. Then you can, you can pick which layout you want. And it's pretty easy for me to add new layouts. People keep paper backups just in case. You know something? If you want to do that, go for it. What if they go out of business? That's actually a really, really good question. You don't want your, your data stranded. Remember what I said before, it is your data. In the case of my flight book, I'm doing this for free. I'm not trying to make money off of it. Um, people do throw me beer money uh, uh, donations. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, if, if, you, if you appreciate the service, please give me a donation, but don't feel compelled to. The nice thing is, uh, the donations are are sufficient that uh, and they're in a separate bank account that's tied to uh, the hosting service. So 
if I were to get hit by a bus tomorrow, the service could continue to run for, uh, for many years uh, into the future. How secure is it? Ask that question. You, are they following best practices? Do they have the right firewall? Are they using uh, encryption appropriately? Again, I don't think anybody has any issues here uh, of the majors, not my, uh, not my flight book. I don't think ForeFlight and so forth have uh, issues on this, uh, but but you do your homework here. Do your due diligence uh, and, and make sure that, that there are no obvious uh, uh, security holes. But there's another difference with electronic logbooks, and that is mobile devices. We all have them now. So Rita Skeeter had the right idea. If you remember the Harry Potter movies, she's sitting there doing her interviews, uh, such as they are, and she has a magic quill in the background that is uh, doing all the transcription for her. Well, we all have Rita Skeeter's magic quill in our pockets. It's called our iPhones or our Androids or our iPads. Okay, the iPad's not in the pocket, but you get, you get the point. These things have GPS on them, and they can track when do you take off? When do you land? What airports did you uh, take off from? Which airports did you land at? Were they full stop landings? Were they night full stop landings? Or were they touch and go? Did you go more than 50 nautical miles? In which case I'm going to count it as uh, cross country because at least that meets all the cross country definitions. It can record your, your uh, flight path as you can see in this screenshot here. Um, uh, with uh, the red being my actual path through space, the blue lines being the airport to airport, uh, great circle paths, um, and you can see a cluster of pictures uh, over the uh, cascades that are geotagged to where I was when I took the picture. So you don't just look at that mountain and say, oh, what a pretty mountain. You can actually look at that mountain and identify which mountain it is. Uh, and it, it can do all of that for me. By the way, it can, it can record how much night flight you have, but it's really important to have a path to get a decent estimate of that. Um, you can imagine if you're doing um, a flight from uh, Seattle to London, you're going to take a, uh, a something approximating a great circle uh, polar route, um, but you might go a little more north or a little more south, depending on uh, on winds perhaps or or ATC or whatever, and uh, as you can see on this screenshot, there's a big difference in how much night flight you're going to have on that uh, on that flight. And yes, I know obviously the, the Earth keeps turning while you're on it, but that actually is is more to my point. Um, the the website uh, has an autofill feature where if you give me a, a Zulu start time and end time, either flight engine or block time, and a, and an airport pair. Uh, I can look up the, the coordinates of the two airports, and I can synthesize a, a great circle path, and I can estimate, assuming of constant speed, how much uh, night flight you have. But it's an estimate, and in a scenario like this, it can actually be off by a decent amount. Whereas if you have your iPhone or your iPad or your Android in the cockpit measuring and listening to the GPS, you can get to the minute accuracy uh, on how much uh, nighttime uh, you have on your flight. Something else I noticed. I've got over 200,000 aircraft in the system. I've got over 90,000 pilots in the system. Um, many of those aircraft are flown by multiple pilots. Many of those pilots fly multiple aircraft. So you have this overlap. And that's a flying club. A flying club is basically a set of pilots who share a set of aircraft. And I belong to a flying club, so I built out some club functionality. So you can create a club on my flight book, and you can set up aircraft in that club and invite people to join. And then the, the club members can schedule uh, aircraft and see the schedules of the aircraft that are in the club. And this is one of the, actually one of the reasons that, that shared aircraft are so important. You can't do this if your aircraft are not shared between uh, pilots. One of the advantages here, though, is that the administrator or the owner of the club can get a, uh, a report of the flying that is done in club aircraft by club members. So if you forget to fill in the, the timesheet that's sitting in the cockpit of the plane uh, after your flight, 
the the club treasurer or the club admin can still figure out who flew the aircraft on that day for how many hours, assuming that they're also using uh, my flight book. You can also um, get all kinds of stats. You can view those flights in, um, in Google Earth. The club maintenance officer can keep track of uh, the maintenance for each aircraft. You know how much time uh, before its uh, annual is due, how much time uh, before it needs new uh, oil change, and you can capture the high watermark uh, uh, tack time and Hobbs time for each aircraft to see how they're doing uh, against things like an oil change. And you can expose your your club to the community to find new members, or you can uh, conversely go find what clubs are near to you to, if you want to join a flying club. So we've actually been we've been using this for about six years in our club uh, uh, and uh, and loving it. I mentioned before uh, signatures and endorsements. Let me dive into that a little bit uh, uh, more deeply. On my flight book, you can have a student and, and instructor relationship between two users and on the system. And what you do is, is you invite the, uh, the you invite the instructor to be your instructor or the instructor invites the student to be their student. It can go in either direction. And there's no nothing preventing an instructor from being both instructor and student for another. Like in our club, we have two, uh, uh, two instructors who give each other flight reviews. Um, but in a particular relationship, the student can request signatures of the instructor and can control the ability of the instructor to view or otherwise edit um, their logbook. The instructor's privileges can sign, are that they can sign the student's flights, they can issue endorsements and keep track of the endorsements that they've issued uh, to a student, and they can view uh, the student's uh, logbook or create entries in the student's logbook if the, if the student has granted uh, that permission. So the way endorsements uh, work is that oops, uh, uh, the, uh, the the instructor can see a list of their students and it digitally issue an endorsement uh, to each uh, student. So something like, uh, here's your tailwheel sign off, or uh, you know, here's your sign off to go for a solo flight, or I find you competent to, to check ride. I've got about 90 templates in the system using the uh, preferred language from the FAA, and you can also create your own uh, custom uh, templates. But the nice thing here is that the instructor can uh, can also see all of the endorsements that they've ever issued. They can also uh, keep track of, of endorsements that they've issued on paper uh, so that they can keep a record of the fact of that endorsement, even though obviously since it was issued on paper, that won't, that won't be electronic in the student's logbook. And this is what an, what endorsements look like on the screen. So when I say a digital endorsement, you'll notice I don't there's no squiggles here uh, of, of you know, fingernail signatures, um, and that's because the instructor had to authenticate themselves with their password in order to get into the system. So there, you don't need a, uh, a, a scribble. Uh, the fact that they've signed in means that it, ha it had to have been them. They've been authenticated and that it couldn't have been done by accident. It couldn't have been done by somebody else. Um, I do, however, support endorsements. If you're not signed in, uh, I do support endorsements where uh, you can just do a scribble uh, signature. It's actually less secure, but it's uh, it's tradition, I suppose. Um, they can also sign flights in uh, in these ways. One, it, it, so the way this works typically is you fill in your flight on your phone, and you uh, save it to your flight or to, to your logbook. Uh, you may have your instructor fill it out uh, for you. That's fine, but you save it to your logbook. Then you hand uh, you you press sign on that flight that's now been saved, and you hand the uh, phone or tablet to the instructor who types in their password to authenticate themselves uh, and adds any comments uh, and signs it. Nice thing is if the instructor's got their CFI certificate in their profile and their um, expiration in the profile, they can they don't have to re-enter that every time. So that that's nice. If they don't have an instructor-student relationship set up, then it's the same thing, but you can do a scribble signature. Um, and, and, and the instructor obviously now does have to type in their, uh, c their certificate and expiration because by definition, I don't know it. So those are two in-person scenarios. 
Uh, but you can also do this over the cloud. Again, another advantage of having the logbook in the cloud. And this is where uh, you both go home after the lesson and uh, the student says, oh, you forgot to sign my logbook and can send a request to the instructor and say, please sign this flight. The instructor can then review that flight, add their comments and sign it. Obviously, this does require a student instructor uh, relationship. Uh, the, if you've given permission for the instructor to view your logbook, then the instructor can actually just proactively go look at your logbook and sign any flight that needs um, signing as well, or perhaps it needs re-signing if it's been modified, uh, which is the top uh, scenario here. Uh, if you edit a flight that, that, that has been signed, then uh, it, it gets shown in red and the little uh, signature certificate um, it gets a little sla red slash through it. And you know, it could have been a benign change, in which case you ask the instructor uh, to re-sign the flight, and then it will turn uh, uh, green again. Uh, or if, if you're sitting there tampering with your, with your flights to try and pad your, your flight experience, well, it's going to show up as red. Um, this is what a uh, scribble signature looks like if you hover the mouse over the little uh, uh, certificate uh, icon there. It obviously it, it obviously doesn't uh, block out everything uh, normally, uh, and when you print out, it it will show it will uh, word wrap around that. Uh, but this is just for space on on a, uh, a screen with a mouse. And of course, uh, on the bottom uh, flight there uh, is a valid signature that's been digitally signed, so it doesn't have the uh, it doesn't have the, the scribble. And then I'll end with, with just some fun stuff that you can do with uh, electronic logbooks. So I do visited airports. Uh, I, I can tell all the airports where you've recorded takeoffs and landings. I can put it on a map, tell you when your first visit, your last visit was, how many times you've been there. You can download it all uh, to a spreadsheet or view it in Google Earth or even estimate the uh, total distance you've you've uh, ever flown. Uh, and it's very easy to see all the flights where, you, where you've where you landed at a particular air, airport. Um, does this have a practical purpose? No, not really. But I think, it's, I think it's a lot of fun, actually. You can make a game of your flying. And so you can uh, view satellite images of airports where you've recorded landings or airports, uh, major airports in the US, if, if, uh, if you like, uh, and see if you can identify them from the air. Uh, points. And this is where, in, when I'm doing this talk live, I ask people if they can identify this. Uh, obviously, hard to do on a recorded video, so I'll uh, I'll leave this as an exercise to the reader. I can show you fun statistics and achievements. You know, when you uh, when you earn a rating or when you uh, ha fly a, a specific number of days in a row uh, or log a certain number of flights. I, I deliberately wave my hands here about what achievements, what badges you can earn. Uh, I think it's actually more fun if you don't know, uh, sort of like a video game where, uh, you know, when you shoot a hundred Nazis, uh, when you hit the hundredth Nazi, uh, you get some uh, better weapon upgrade or something like that. Uh, but the idea is you don't, you don't necessarily know that these are out there, but then you earn it. It's like, hey, wow, that's kind of cool. So, in short, if this is your image of a logbook, uh, then you're missing most of the picture. And this is where, at Oshkosh, I ask for questions. Uh, obviously, that doesn't work on YouTube, but by all means, feel free to uh, contact me uh, with any questions that you have. Uh, the best way to reach me is using the contact link on the My Flightbook uh, website. Uh, that will get to me, and I'm pretty good about answering uh, questions uh, within, usually within hours, unless I'm unless I'm traveling. Uh, so I hope uh, you found this useful, and uh, please let me know if you have any any questions. Thank you.